The following program is sponsored by CBN. Today, a small town doc. Children hardly knew who I was. My wife certainly never saw me. With a big time problem. And if you think you're Superman, then control it. And it's one he wrote himself. Let me go fill up the pharmacy. Let me take four or five of them in the parking lot. His final RX. Close the garage door and run the engine and it'll all be over. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club. Ladies and gentlemen, there's something we need to understand about ourselves. We are social creatures. We like to get together with our family. We like to have friends in for dinner. We like to go out to eat in restaurants. We like the pleasure of just getting together with other people, to go to sporting events, to go to football games, to go to all this stuff. Now we can't do that. As a result, the, the, the number of people committing suicide has gone up dramatically. The number of cases of domestic abuse has gone up dramatically. And all this business of being socially quarantined is really hurting us. But we hear about the cases of people who have the disease who are dying, but we don't hear so much about the people who are in their homes suffering with some kind of depression and the violence that's taking place, violence against spouses, violence against children, is rising dramatically. And we need to do something about it. But the crisis of COVID-19 has been ravaging nursing homes. Could the deaths be far worse than reported, especially in New York? And does Governor Andrew Cuomo have something to hide? As Charlene Aaron reports, Families and lawmakers are demanding answers. The official COVID-19 death toll in nursing homes across New York stands at 6,600. But that number may be far greater because the state only counts residents who died on nursing home property and not those who died after being transported to hospitals. For Fox News meteorologist Janice Dean, the stats on COVID-related nursing home deaths are personal. Earlier this year, she lost her elderly in-laws to the virus. So coronavirus happens, we're not allowed to see them. We didn't know his dad was ill at all. We were getting updates from the uh, nursing home, regular updates. And one Saturday morning, we get an update the end of March saying, your dad's not feeling well. And three hours later, they call us back and tell us he's died. His mom was in the assisted living residence. And a several, several days later, she got ill um, and she had to be brought to the hospital. And they diagnosed her with coronavirus and she just, you know, died a few days later. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo says his state has only 20% of COVID deaths from nursing homes compared to 68% in Pennsylvania. 64% in Massachusetts, and 44% in New Jersey. The controversy began in March when Cuomo mandated recovering coronavirus patients be placed in nursing homes. This despite the availability of the Navy hospital ship Comfort, 2,500 hospital beds set up inside the Javits Convention Center, and the field hospital set up by Samaritan's Purse. Many say the policy led to thousands of possibly preventable deaths across the state. Kentucky Senator Rand Paul wants Cuomo removed from office. Governor Cuomo ought to be impeached for the worst public policy, public health decision, maybe in a century, sending patients with coronavirus back to nursing homes. Despite multiple calls for an independent investigation, the governor's still refusing as recent as last week. No, I wouldn't do an investigation. I think you'd have to be blind to realize it's not political. Uh, just look at where it comes from and look at the sources and look at their political affiliation. The New York State Legislature wants answers and recently invited families whose loved ones died in elder care facilities to testify. During those hearings, lawmakers also grilled State Health Commissioner Howard Zucker for failing to report the actual number of COVID deaths in nursing homes. Your administration's definition I truly misrepresents the true scale of this crisis in our nursing home. Let's try and get the full picture here and now. Uh, how many of New York's nursing home residents died in hospitals? I'm not prepared to give you a specific number. Meanwhile, Dean believes she was disinvited from the public hearing because of her affiliation with Fox News. Regardless, she says all the families affected deserve answers. 
I would like a 9-11 style commission hearing uh, because it's not only New York. There are several other states that did the same thing, putting coronavirus patients into nursing homes. So, um, you know, listen, that that's my hope. I, I don't know if that'll ever happen. Um, but my argument is, Governor Cuomo, what do you have to hide? Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Oh, there are going to be plenty of scandals and plenty of cover-ups because the, the death toll worldwide is coming close to a million. Uh, you know, we've had worse, th- worse pandemics before flu. And, of course, when you got the Black Death during the Middle Ages, it, it wiped up over half the population. It was just horrible. Well, there's good news on the medical front, though, in the fight against COVID-19. Even though the numbers keep getting worse, Wendy Griffin has more about that. That's right, Pat. The death toll nationwide has now passed 170,000. And five states have set new records for weekly deaths. But the FDA has approved a new saliva test for COVID-19 developed by Yale University. It's simpler and less expensive, as little as $10 per test which will invariably increase testing capacity. Meanwhile, a New York Times report says new research is offering hope. Unpublished studies say patients who've had mild cases of the coronavirus show signs of developing strong long-term immunity. Those studies are still being reviewed, but experts commissioned by the Times call them promising and exactly what you would hope for. Well, violence is rocking America's cities as protesters continue to push for defunding the police. And some city councils are complying. Crime rates are shooting sky high. George Thomas has the latest. From Los Angeles to New York City, from Philadelphia to San Francisco, the movement to defund police departments across the country is growing. This as at least 12 other cities also brace for severe budget cuts not seen in more than a decade. The result, some say, is a spike in violence nationwide. Days after the city council in Austin, Texas, voted to slash $150 million from the police budget, three Cedar Park police officers, a suburb of the city, were shot on Sunday after a man barricaded himself with three of his family members. I visited them in the hospital along with their families. They are all in stable condition and doing well. The state's governor warning the cuts in police funding will pave the way for lawlessness. In Chicago, new video emerges showing a violent confrontation between Black Lives Matter protesters and police. This group changed their appearance and began pushing our officers and eventually assaulting them. One protester allegedly hitting a police officer repeatedly with a skateboard. The mayor of Chicago saying the attack on police officers was planned and that protesters came looking for a fight. We are absolutely not going to tolerate people who come to these protests looking for a fight and are intending to injure our police officers and injure innocent people. Authorities in Chicago now monitoring social media sites for threats against officers and businesses. What we want to do is expand our capacity in, in, in this space of looking at intelligence on open source. And it's not just in Chicago. Violence now erupting in other major cities across the country as well. In New York City, more than two dozen shootings in less than 48 hours. In Philadelphia, a mass shooting at a block party in just three teens and two others. Shots were also fired at police officers. 60 shell casings from several weapons were found on the scene, including rounds from an AR-15. On Sunday in Cincinnati, 18 people were shot, four killed in four different incidents. Horrific and tragic that we have uh, this much violence and potential for that much loss of life in our city. All this happening as a new study shows violent crimes on the rise nationwide. Murder rates in 20 major cities spiking by 37% between May and June of this year. George Thomas, CBN News. Mm. Pat, this is very serious. What do you think? Uh, I think that the whole move to defund the police is brought about by uh, people who want to destroy our country. And the trouble is city councils are yielding to the mob instead of yielding to their intelligence. And the mob is ruling in city after city after city. And it's shocking the numbers of people who are being killed. The violence is taking place. And the one thing you do when you have that much trouble is to 
beef up the people who are standing against the trouble. Instead of that, the city councils in city after city after city across America are taking money away from the police. In New York, $1 billion being taken out of the police budget. Just think of that. In the middle of a, a crisis of people who are uh, want to destroy uh, the governmental structure of our nation, and, and the cities are being laid open wide to terrible violence, the worst violence we've ever seen. And it's being orchestrated by Antifa and these other groups like Black Lives Matter, which are trying to destroy America. They, that's their open-ended goal. They want to destroy the, the, the freedoms we have in America and lay us subject to a socialist dictatorship. And the amazing thing is we have a one particular party, a political party, that is in favor of defunding the police, in favor of some of these rioters, and is not speaking out openly against them. And you say, why can't we get together as Americans to understand there's an evil in our society that needs to be squelched? And it won't be squelched by taking away the weapons we have to control it. Well, that particular party is getting ready to have a, a virtual convention right now, and Wendy can tell us about it. They are indeed, Pat. Democrats open their national convention tonight. The virtual event features speakers from across the country. Former First Lady Michelle Obama will deliver the keynote. Others include progressive standard bearer Bernie Sanders and former Ohio Governor John Kasich, a Republican. The four-night event is anchored in Milwaukee, but due to COVID-19, only a small contingent will be on site. And you can follow the nightly coverage on our website, that's cbnnews.com. Well, high heat and lightning are fueling major wildfires across California. The Loyalton fire has burned at least 20,000 acres. Thousands of people are under evacuation orders. This just one of dozens of fires consuming the state in the middle of a massive heat wave. Over the weekend, power officials declared an emergency, temporarily cutting power to hundreds of thousands of customers to protect the power grid. And speaking of those high temps in Death Valley, Pat, the high was 130 degrees Sunday, possibly one of the three highest temperatures ever recorded on planet Earth. Global warming, <laughs> I'm telling you, that's hot. 120 degrees, the highest ever recorded on Earth. This is shocking. Whew. Terry. That's why air conditioning was, <laughs> was for, the best. Well, you know, <laughs> fortunately, it's a little cooler. We live in a wonderful part of the world. I mean, in, instead of going up, temperatures in, in our area, Virginia Beach, have gone down to a nice comfortable in the 70s. and. It's very comfortable. It, it is now. It's been a little warm for some well, it's been here. warm, but now the, 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 the Lord summer. just keeps summer blessing us. I'm not, <laughs> if I'm being blessed, I'm not going to complain about it. <laughs> That's right. I, I am rejoicing in the goodness of the Lord. All right, Terry. <laughs> well, still ahead, a bitter pill to swallow. This top doc got hooked on painkillers. His only escape, closing his garage door and turning on his car engine. So what stopped his suicide? And he's rushed into war zones, heard rockets exploding around him, and seen biblical prophecy unfold in real time. CBN's Chris Mitchell recaps 20 years of reporting from Jerusalem. What could the next 20 look like? Stay tuned. Ongoing Palestinian attacks, two wars between Israel and Lebanon, the Arab Spring, a bloody civil war in Syria, the rise of ISIS and Christian persecution, the list goes on. Who's there? Who's in the midst of it? Our CBN News Bureau in Jerusalem has been on the front lines covering it all. Today, on the 20th anniversary of its humble beginnings, Chris Mitchell shows us how it's grown into a global outreach. On August 17, 2000, I arrived in Israel with my wife Liz and our three children, Philip, Kathleen, and Grace, to open the CBN News Bureau. 
We had no idea what would begin just five weeks later. The bombing comes one day before the International Court of The Hague. A four-year-long campaign of Palestinian terror attacks and suicide bombings known as the Second Intifada rocked Israel. It was a chaotic time to not only raise a family, but to begin a business. It started in a one-room office, a small staff, and a mandate to cover the news from a biblical perspective without a bias against Israel or the Jewish people. During the ensuing years, we've been able to cover firsthand how Jerusalem and the Middle East remains the epicenter for world-shaking events. Our Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell joins us now from Gaza Strip. In 2005, we brought you the wrenching Israeli pullout from the Gaza Strip as thousands of Israelis were evicted. The next year, Pat Robertson joined us on the front lines of the 2006 Second Lebanon War and prayed for Israel live on the 700 Club. And we pray for Israel. We pray for these who are engaged in fighting. We pray for those who are in leadership that they might have wisdom. Minutes later, he was interviewed while Hezbollah rockets struck the hills behind us. When the Arab Spring erupted in 2011, we sped to Tahrir Square in Cairo, with thousands gathered to protest the government of Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak. CBN News covered the rise of ISIS and its reign of terror, from the bombed-out city of Sinjar to a mass grave of Yazidis. We sat down and felt the anguish of a woman who just lost her son and saw the ruins of the Islamic State after its demise in the city of Mosul. We spent time with the Kurdish Peshmerga, the brave men and women spearheading the battle against ISIS. We met face to face with persecuted Christians and told the world about the awful rise of Christian persecution throughout the Middle East. Many times, CBN News went to Israel's southern border when wars broke out with Hamas, and went underground on Israel's northern border to get a rare look at a Hezbollah terror tunnel. And we've been on the scene during the Trump years and covered the historic decision by President Trump to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. And we saw the opening of Saudi Arabia to the world. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. In 2011, CBN News began the award-winning program Jerusalem Dateline. Now entering our 10th season, it's broadcast around the world and translated into multiple languages. Over 20 years, our viewers have seen prophetic stories of the Jewish people returning to the land of Israel and the remarkable archaeological finds that prove the Bible, like the seal of King Hezekiah and the pilgrimage road in the city of David where Jesus walked. Through it all, the Bureau sees itself like the book of Isaiah says, to be watchmen on the walls of Jerusalem, and also like the tribe of Issachar, to understand the times. Chris is with, with us now. Chris, you know, like, like the biblical uh, uh, group, uh, is it time, are times uh, sufficient for you now? Or the, what do you think? Well, the times are amazing right now, uh, Pat. You know, just in the last few days, we've had this UAE peace deal, which really just reshuffled the whole Middle East. It really has profound geopolitical and prophetic implications. You know, Turkey's considering cutting off diplomatic ties. They say they're never going to forgive the UAE's hypocritical behavior. And hypocritical may be the term for Turkey, since they already have normal relations uh, with Israel. Why are they so upset, Pat? They want to be the leader of the Muslim world. They increasingly see Israel as an enemy, and they're relying more and more with Iran and Russia. So what are the prophetic implications? In Ezekiel 38 and 39, it says that a confederation will come against Israel when it's dwelling and safety and security. And some are wondering if right now we're seeing the beginning of that safety and security before this confederation comes, comes against Israel from the north. And, and Pat, you know, in 20 years, uh, there's a lot of stories. And I want to tell a story about you on the northern border of 2006, on, on Israel in 2006. We just had it in our, in our clip right there. It's one of my favorite stories. So 4 o'clock, we have a 700 club. We do a live shot. You prayed for Israel. I get a call from Fox News. Jennifer Griffin calls up and says, we want to do a live shot with 
Pat at five o'clock. Well, Hezbollah didn't get the message. And so Katusha rockets are falling from Matula to Kiryat Shimona. You know the geography. It's about five miles away. And so when we get to the production facility, they tell everybody we have to go into a safe room. Well, that lasted about three minutes with you. And you said, I'm going to go up on the roof and do the uh, do the live shot. And uh, there you were doing the live shot with the smoke from the Katusha rockets in the hills behind me. And so after 20 years, you know, there's a few acknowledgments. And Pat, I just want to uh, single out you. I want to thank you and honor you, Pat. <laughs> thank you. So when I came here 20 years ago, I stood on your sterling reputation, the goodwill that you had built up for decades. And we're here to continue the mandate of what you told the Lord on the Mount of Olives so many years ago, That's right. that you would stand with Israel and the Jewish people. And we take that seriously. Gordon and his Israeli documentaries, they've had a profound impact here in the last several years. And we serve with an incredible news professionals led by Rob Allman, an amazing staff here in Jerusalem. And in those 20 years, we've had the support of CBN Partners. And where would, be, where would we be without them? Prayer warriors who have faithfully prayed, me, prayed for me in the Bureau. And I think I'm alive because I've been on the front lines with ISIS because of their prayers. And Pat, I just want to end with this. The hero of uh, this story is my wife, Liz. She came to a war zone, raised a family, stood by me with all these years. And a shout out to Philip, Kathleen and Grace. And I like to say that they came on the journey, but they stayed for the adventure and were ruined for the ordinary. And I love them all. Whoa. And the best is yet to come. And Whoa. most of all, Pat, the Lord, he's been with us all Amen. the way. He promised never to leave us or forsake us. He's been faithful to that promise, whether on the front lines with ISIS, whether up with you on the northern border in Israel, or here in Jerusalem. Well, Chris, it's a fabulous job you're doing. I, I want to expand a little bit about that Ezekiel 38 thing. I've been waiting for that to happen. Uh, when a coalition is going to come against Israel, uh, it's going to uh, involve Turkey. Gog and Magog is primarily in Turkey. And we've got uh, uh, Syria in there. You see, and Rush means head, but it, it could, could be those nations. Uh, the, in the Caucasus region, and uh, Magog is right there in, in, in Turkey. And uh, Chris, do you feel that we might be on the border? If, if that's the case, it would be a major invasion of Israel by people like, like uh, the, the uh, people from Iran who, who vowed to destroy Israel. And now Erdogan is, is getting on board could this be possible in in the near future? Do you think is it, are the are the uh, signs beginning to line up for that? It's very possible, Pat, and here's why. Because, you know, when you read Ezekiel 38 and 39, it says that Israel is at a time of safety, security, unwalled uh, villages. And so why would that be? And it's possible, and some people are thinking and speculating that, these peace treaty with the UAE and Israel, could it be the beginning of the safety? As well, you're also seeing this confederation Turkey allying with Iran and Russia, and could be this one day, this confederation that comes down against Israel that's in safety and security. I don't know if we're on the cusp of it, Pat, but we're seeing that trend right now, just in the last few days of, uh, of what's happening. And maybe all this is leading up, obviously, to the Lord's return eventually. Uh, so, Pat, you know, looking ahead, we're going to have a lot to report on, and we'll have a lot to talk about in the years to come. Well, you, you're, you're not a living history. You're making history. So, thank Chris Mitchell is doing a great job, ladies and gentlemen, bringing you the news all over this nation and all over the world. Chris Mitchell and our Jerusalem News Bureau. Terry. Well, now is the time for Christians to show the world that we will support Israel and the Jewish people. To help you do just that, we have a free booklet available. It's called Why Christians Stand with Israel. In this, you'll discover why Christians support the Jewish state, and you'll learn why we must stand together with the Jewish people. If you'd like to get your free copy, call our toll-free number, 1-800-700-7000, or you can visit cbn.com slash standwithisrael. Israel. We'd love for you to have this. It's a great little booklet and uh, something every Christian really Amen. should read and understand. Okay. Well, still to come, paralyzing pain for 10 months. This woman couldn't afford to see a doctor. So how did she get a hallelujah healing? Stay tuned to find out. But first, doctor's orders, dozens of Vicodin every day. 
He had been writing fake prescriptions for himself for 15 years, and he couldn't stop. What broke the cycle of addiction? You're going to see. It's next. You are watching The 700 Club, and I'm so happy to have you with us today. God is going to be blessing you because we've got some special things that will touch your heart. Ten feet tall and bulletproof as a small town doctor, Lewis felt like he was a superhero. But over the years, he worked himself to exhaustion. Then one day, Lewis said, I've got to take something to give me a boost of energy. So he picked up some pills called Vicodin. And soon the superhero was swallowing 40 of these Vicodin pills every single day. The mountain town of Clarksburg, West Virginia seemed an ideal place for Dr. Lou Hortensio to raise his family and set up his practice in 1982. It was small and they needed good doctors. I did take good care of people. I really cared about them and, and they knew that I cared. Affectionately called Doc O, Lou embraced his role as a small town doctor, making house calls and working 16 hour days. While he genuinely cared about his patients, something else was driving him. Sometimes there's a little bit of self-satisfaction and all that, you know, look what I've done, look, look, look how much they love me. And if at my core I don't love myself, uh, then I need everyone else to love me to make me feel adequate. While he relished the admiration, Lou admits he too often neglected his wife and three children. When you're home, you're paying attention to your beeper, your phone, or you're running back to the hospital, the emergency room, and children hardly knew who I was. My wife certainly never saw me. It went on for years, as Lou worked, sometimes to the point of exhaustion, to meet everyone's expectations, trying to earn their love. I felt like I had to perform at such a high level, be 10 feet tall and bulletproof and faster than a speeding locomotive and trying to make your patients happy. You're trying to make the pharmaceutical reps happy. You're trying to make your family happy. There was no one other than me in this whole deal. Then in 1988, working late one night, Lou had an excruciating headache. But when over-the-counter meds didn't help, he reached for something stronger, a Vicodin sample that a pharmaceutical rep had left. It gave me this tremendous relief of pain and suffering, but also gave me this sense of euphoria that I could do anything. And that just grew and grew and grew. As did his addiction. At first, he'd self-medicate for an extra boost of energy. When I felt inadequate, when I would run out of steam, drugs filled that gap. The other side of that is if you think you're Superman and you think you can do that and control it, that it won't take over your life. Except it did. Within a few years, he was using daily. And by the late 90s, he was taking up to 40 pills a day, writing fake prescriptions to keep them coming. You focus on how do I feel? How do I feel? How do I feel? Do I have any more pills? Let me go write a prescription. Let me go fill in the pharmacy. Let me take four or five of them in the parking lot. During that time, Lou's wife realized he had a drug problem. With their marriage already strained, she took the kids and moved to Pittsburgh, two hours away. They tried to make it work, but ultimately divorced in the early 2000s. By now, even his performance at work was slipping. There was pressure coming in from everywhere. I'd failed as a husband, I'd failed as a father. Practice wasn't going well, and I realized that I could not stop using medication. I couldn't stop using the opiates. And that was the pattern I was stuck in, stuck in, and stuck in. Unable to see a way out, one night in the fall of 2002, he decided to take the only escape he knew. I'm going to go in my car, park in my garage at night, close the garage door and run the engine, and it'll all be over. But the fumes seemed to have no effect. I was crying out to God, and God, I really didn't know or understand, saying, God, take me out of this mess. I can't do this anymore. You've got to do something. Take me out. But God didn't take me out. But he says God did answer his prayer. The next day, a patient in ICU crashed. They saved the patient, 
but in the chaos, one nurse got Lou's attention. Her name was Donetta. She was very calm and serene. I shared with her a little bit about what was going on in my life. Donetta prayed for him and invited him to church. After a few Sundays, Lou had a realization. I had messed up terribly, and I needed to be forgiven. And I asked Donetta, how do I be forgiven? And she said, you just get forgiven for just asking. That's how that works. And I said, Jesus, you've got to take this. You've got to take over in my life, because I sure can't do it on my own. I sure can't run this thing. I'm running in the ground. I'm running myself in the ground. I'm going to be dead. But it wasn't until a few weeks later he decided to give his life over to Jesus and accept his unconditional love. He confided in a patient who was a Christian that he hadn't prayed to accept Jesus. And he said, well, let's do that right now. Get down on your knees, I'll get down with you and we'll pray this prayer. I got up off the floor feeling like really legitimately 10 feet tall and bulletproof, but only with Jesus, only with that power. Not what would Jesus do, it's what has Jesus done. With God's strength, Lou quit using drugs. He and Donetta grew closer and married in 2004. He did lose his medical license and served community service for the fraudulent prescriptions he wrote. Although eligible to have his license reinstated, he says God showed him a new purpose. I was able to take that community service and turn that into ministry to an extent. Use all this to help someone else. He's now a ministry leader with Celebrate Recovery and serves as executive director of the Clarksburg Mission, helping those who need shelter, food, and hope in Jesus. It doesn't make any sense how my life ended up like this. It only makes sense in the kingdom of God. You've got to have Jesus Christ as your savior or it just doesn't work. You know, when the troubles of life overcome us, <clears throat> there used to be a time when you would turn to the Lord. Now people are turning to what seems to be an easy way. We've got so many different drugs. We've got oxycodone, and we've got hydrocodone, and we've got Vicodin, and we've got all these other pills. And many of them are legitimate. They're prescribed by doctors, and it takes the edge off and makes you feel good for a while. And so you say, well, let's take a few more. And before long, the devil has you. And there's so many people watching this program right now, you've got the same problem. You have had headaches, you have been exhausted, you have been depressed, and you say, I think I'll just take a few of these pills. And you go to a doctor and the doctor writes you out a prescription and says, here, go get these. And, the, and you say, it must be legit because I have a prescription. And the next thing you know, you are an addict and you're hooked. God Almighty has an answer. There is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not be let you be tested beyond what you are able, but will with the testing make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God has a way out, and the way out is overcoming, not going under. You go over, not under. And God wants you to be an overcomer. And if you will turn to him right now, he will deliver you from addiction. And he will give you hope and joy you've never known possible. And your life will be full of joy and peace. And the pressure will be taken away because you have given the pressure to Jesus. He once spoke to me. He said, this is my work. I'll carry the burden. And he will carry the burden of your life if you'll turn it over to him. So what I want to t talk to you right now, if you have a problem with any kind of addiction to drugs, they may be prescription drugs, they may have been given you by a doctor. Now, if you have the oxycodone or hydrocodone, those things are very pernicious. And you need something along the way to kind of ease you down or you'll go right back into them. And so there, there are other uh, you know, forms of, of, of medicine that will help you uh, e ease off of those things. Because if you go um, cold turkey, you immediately come back on them. But God will set you free and do a miracle. 
And right now, I want to pray with you, and I want you to pray with me. If you have this problem, God Almighty stands ready. He is all-powerful, and He can set you free in an instance, whether it's alcoholism or something to do with drugs. Bow your head and pray with me right now. Don't be afraid. Pray these words. Let's believe God. Father, you pray, pray with me wherever you are. Father, you know I have been taken over by drugs. My life is now a shamble. I have looked for a way out of stress, and now I am hooked, and I ask you to set me free. Lord, you came to deliver the captives, and I ask you to come and set me free. In the name of Jesus, I admit, Lord, that I'm a sinner, but I know that you died for sinners, and you didn't come to condemn me, but to give me a new life. And so, Lord, I ask you to come into my heart, fill me with yourself, Come into my heart in all of your power, and may the Holy Spirit deliver me from that which is bonding me, because I want to be free. And now I, I speak to this addiction and to Satan, you shall not have me anymore. I am free in the name of Jesus. Loose me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. In your holy name, amen. Now, if you prayed with me just then, I want you to start out, and I want you to start growing in the Lord. I don't want you to go back to where you've been. I want you to come out. Like the man in the pigsty, he, he didn't stay in the pigsty. He came out and went to his father. And I want to send you something, and I think it will help you. It's called A New Day. And in it's a little CD. I've done a compact disc that has about 70-some minutes of very compact teaching, and it has a little book about scriptures. I'll give this to you free. All you have to do is just call in. There's no, no money involved whatsoever, nothing involved, no money. The Lord has paid the price. We don't have to worry about you paying a price. God's already paid for it. And your salvation is free, but it costs the life of Jesus Christ. So you've got him as a Savior. Confess it. Don't be afraid. Pick up the phone. Call in right now. It's 1-800-700-7000. Say, I just prayed with Pat. I want you to know I'm free, and I want you to pray with me. And our guys on the phone, the men and women, they love to hear from you. Many of them have had the same experience you have. 1-800-700-7000. And I'll send you this little book, A New Day, free of charge. But if you don't want to tell us your name or anything, you just call anyhow and say, look, I just prayed that prayer. I want you to know I am free in the name of Jesus. Okay, Terry. Well, up next, healed, but how? This woman had shooting pain in her right shoulder. She couldn't bend her arm. She couldn't even dress herself. So how was she cured without seeing a doctor? Find out. And then later, your questions and honest answers. Warren asks, my grandson asked me to co-sign for an apartment he wants to move into with his girlfriend. By co-signing, have I committed a sin? Hear Pat's answer. That's all later on today's program. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi says she's calling the House back into session over the U.S. Postal Service crisis. She and other Democrats believe President Donald Trump is trying to undermine the agency heading into the November election. The president says he plans to block a $25 million request for emergency funding for the Postal Service and a Democratic proposal of $3.6 billion to fund additional work for mail-in voting. Well, Malawi's new president, Dr. Lazarus Shakwera, says he wants to pastor a nation. In an exclusive interview with CBN South Africa, the president dis discussed global issues as well as his Christian faith. Born into a poor rural family, Shakwera spent much of his life as a pastor and denominational leader. He won the June 2020 election and made history as the first African opposition candidate to defeat an incumbent in a rerun. 
He strongly believes that God called him to this high position. And you can see more of his encouraging story on YouTube and Facebook. You can also find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to CBN.com slash international. Pat and Terry will be back right after this. Shooting pain in her right arm made it hard for Patty Bryant to do much of anything. She couldn't even dress herself. For months, Patty prayed to be healed, but she was also asking for something more. So what was it? And how did it lead to what she calls a hallelujah healing? Gatlinburg, Tennessee local Patty Bryant stays busy running one of the country's largest ministries for single moms. But after pressure washing around the house one day in July 2018, she felt a shooting pain in her right shoulder that would sideline her for months. And I actually couldn't move my arm at all. It was like, like stiff. I couldn't bend it. It was very frustrating. And living on a limited income from the donations to her ministry, Patty couldn't afford health insurance. So she felt going to a doctor wasn't an option. Different things were happening, like the maneuvering of my fingers and my hands, they would drop. I kind of knew it had to do with my rotator cuff. I thought it would go away. And after six months, it didn't go away. As the months passed, Patty was losing her patience and her independence. I don't think I ever had an old mentality, but when your body is not doing what it's supposed to do, like couldn't get dressed, like it would take me a while to put this on. I, I felt very alone. There's no doubt about that. I felt very alone. Despite her doubts and frustrations, Patty still turned to the one person she knew she could count on. I was praying for a total healing to not just a healing of what I was before, but what I was many years ago. I never had any doubts. God was going to heal me in time. I knew he was going to do something. I just didn't know when. Then one afternoon, almost 10 months after her injury, Patty tuned into the 700 Club, where a familiar voice said something that caught her attention. There's, there's somebody, I, uh, the, the state of Tennessee, I, I think you've pulled a shoulder muscle, and uh, I, I, I don't know who, where, or what, but I believe God is healing you right now. So just raise your arm where the shoulder muscle, you couldn't work it and work it back and forth and you'll be completely healed. I got the most amazing peace in my body. And I knew it was the presence of the Holy Spirit. It was like, oh my gosh, I can move my shoulder, hallelujah. And it was instant. Wow, Lord, you're really hearing me. You're really listening to me. Thank you, Father. I called up my friends, and then I called up the 700 Club. I said, I just want you to know, I was the person in Tennessee, and God healed me instantly. Today, if you come through the Gatlinburg Mountains, you'll find Patty pain-free and as active as ever. And when she isn't helping others, she's pausing to give credit and praise to Jesus Christ. I know God brought me here for such a time as this. There's no pain. There's none. And I couldn't do this. Are you kidding me? And I can move my arm around and pick things up. He can do it for me. He could do it for anybody. Patty is right. He did it for her and he will do it for you. There are many of you I know who stay tuned into our program for this moment in time when we pray for you and for your needs. And so let's yes. just declare God's power. Wasn't that marvelous? Power. Yes. Patty in Tennessee. Yes. Absolutely. Right. Hey, here's one. Michael, who lives in Colorado Springs, he, he had a condition known as dry eyes. Mm. And one day he was watching, and Terry said, someone else has dry eyes. It's not just unpleasant. It's affecting your vision. Eyes are so dry. Jesus is healing your eyes. By faith, Michael said, that's me. Immediately his eyes were healed. and. 
He's got plenty of moisture. That's awesome. Yeah. This is Mary Pat, who lives in Portsmouth, Virginia. She couldn't shake a lingering and annoying dry cough that followed after a terrible cold she'd had three weeks earlier. One day she tuned into this program and was delightfully surprised to hear you pray over her condition and call her by name. You said God right now is healing the influenza virus. You've been coughing. You've been crying out to God. I believe your name is Mary. You're being healed. Mary believed she has been healed ever since. Isn't that great? It is great. Now, folks, look, God's no respecter of persons, and he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. Because with God, all things are possible. Mm -hmm. Now, we want to pray for you. Terry and I are going to believe God for you. So would you please pray with us? And don't be saying in your mind, no, it can't happen. Just open yourself to God's power. Father, I join with Terry, and we pray together. What is it, Lord? Somebody's got something called Qatar. You've got a, your nose runs continuously, and you, you don't know what it is right now. Just put your hand on your nose, and you are healed in Jesus' name. Terry, what else do you have? Yeah, someone else, you have a problem with your feet. It's not fallen arches, but you're, it's very painful for you to walk. God is healing that condition for you. You're going to have your mobility back again right now in Jesus' name. Somebody has got a, a, a dislocated vertebra in your back. You've been, it's really sore. And right now, just if you, if you can get your hand back there, touch it. If you don't, do you just believe God? Mm. Yeah. Now, someone else you're, you're you. hearing has just kind of interrupted. All of a sudden, you can't hear well out of one side of yes. your, your hearing. And God is opening that right now. You're just going to hear like paper crinkling inside your ear, and your hearing is restored in Jesus' name. Uh, there's... You've been taking blood thinner. There's a burst starter right now, and you've got a great big patch of, of blue where the blood has come out. The Lord is healing at it right this moment in the name of Jesus. Danella, I believe the name is, in the name of Jesus. Touch them. Now, Lord, may the anointing of the Holy Spirit reach out to everyone in this audience who's crying out to you. Lord, answer their prayer. Hear the cry of your people and do miracles in their behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay. So, we had some questions. Well, we've got some questions. Let's for go you. for questions. Okay, this All first right. one comes from Gail, who says, The pastor of my small church encouraged us to take money from our retirement accounts and give it to the church because the church is having financial problems. Later, I discovered the pastor and his wife drive an Audi and Mercedes and live in a very nice home. Is it right for a pastor to ask a congregation to donate retirement account money to save the church, but they do not seem to be sacrificing? Oh. I think that, if I can use the term, is an abomination. In the early days of CBN, I gave of my money, if I had some, to help the ministry. I actually mortgaged a car to take the money from the car to give to the ministry. And I didn't take a salary for the longest kind of time. I, I, I don't take a salary from CBN, I might add right now. And I think for a guy to be living large and asking his people to take their retirement fund, that is, before God, it's an abomination. Don't do it, all right? This is Warren Pat, who says, My grandson asked me to co-sign for an apartment he wants to move into with his girlfriend. They both go to college and have jobs. By co-signing, have I committed a sin? Oh, you certainly are. You're enabling him to do something you know is wrong. Yeah. For heaven's sakes, don't co-sign a note. You know, don't do that. Don't ever do that. <laughs> you know, you don't, don't go on somebody's note. I mean, it's, the Bible is very specific. Why should your bed be taken away from you and for, for going on somebody else's debt? Don't even think about it, all right? This is Kenny, who says, if heaven is real, why are so many religious people the first to grab all the supplies and guns and hide in the closet? <laughs> well, I, I, I think that that's a little bit of a joke, isn't it? But you know the truth is, if we have a major problem, there is no quantity of food you can store up. You can't do it. I mean, you can't. I mean, if there's no food, no water, no nothing, I mean, you can hit a little bit to kind of tide you over for a couple of months, but 
the idea is if we're going to heaven, you don't want to starve to death while here on earth. And there's nothing wrong with providing a little something along the way. But the truth is, if there's a major, major problem, I'm not sure that you'll be able to function. Mm -hmm. But having a little garden or something like that isn't a bad idea. Okay. Okay, this is Patty who says, how can I be an influence for my adult children to accept the Lord? They seem so lost since their dad passed on and have such anxiety and fear. I speak the word to them, but I don't feel they're hearing me. Um, they won't hear you as much as they'll see your life. You say, look, I'm living for God. I praise the Lord. And every time you see, you say, I'm really happy and I love you so much. And life is so good. And this is the day the Lord has made. Continually show them an example of why you are an overcomer. They won't hear your words, but they'll look at the way you live. We leave you with these words from Philippians. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Well, tomorrow, the end of Alzheimer's, a plan that has helped patients reverse their symptoms. Wow. It's a miracle. You, you want to listen to that and hear what the doctor has to tell us. It's very good stuff. Well, that's all the time we've got for Terry and all of us. This is Pat Robertson. Thank you so much for being here. Remember, our telephones are available if you want to call. Somebody's here to love you. Till tomorrow. See you later. Bye-bye.